It's terrific to be here in, with you all in Queensland and um, I'm looking forward to having a chance to talk to you about uh, this work. Um, I'd like to just give you a bit of a sense of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'd like to just give us a bit of context before I talk specifically about the Sex and Ethics Program. I want to give you a sense of where this fits in the broader picture of violence prevention education. So. <coughs> A bit of context. Um, in Australia we are probably still at a very early stage in developing what we would call probably best practice in terms of violence prevention education. As many of you would know there's been lots of activities that many of us have been involved in over many years but whether or not it actually makes a difference is a big question for us in terms of whether it changes any behaviour. And I'm particularly interested in primary prevention. I'd like to prevent violence before it happened rather than, um, you know, endlessly keeping doing all the things that we do, which are very, very important, but we need to have a context of trying to really bring about a cultural change which makes uh, violence completely unacceptable in all its forms. One of the things that's um, been fairly clear from looking at the international research is that um, People have developed certain kinds of programs and within those programs there have been some embedded theoretical and ideological positions. Now by that I mean things like a lot of the programs in many places around the world have tended to focus their attention around prevention education as being um, focused on women. That women experience the highest levels of violence and sexual violence but we're also supposed to fix it. And um, this is fundamentally a problem, I think, because we need to work effectively with men as allies in the process of prevention. So many of the programs that you can read about in journals and so forth have tended to report on programs that have been developed particularly focusing on women, and they've tended um, very much to think about risk and to talk about the ways in which women could minimise risk. So this is the kind of context in which I wade into uh, the issue of violence prevention education in the late 1990s. And I was surprised by the fact of these, these sort of findings and I thought, well, we can do better than this, quite frankly. We need to uh, move it along. Um, and so that provides an opportunity, I think, for us to think differently about how can we do effective work that ha makes a difference and that is framed within a positive framework of ethical relationships rather than focusing on thinking that we can stop violence by talking about um, the bad things that people do. So if you say to most people, well, rape and domestic violence is a bad thing, many people would go, yes, yes it is, but that doesn't necessarily lead to a change in behaviour. So we need to kind of think through that a bit more and become a bit more sophisticated, I think, in the way we approach that. So this led me to a particular approach which is based on sexual ethics and I want to say a bit more about that in a moment. So in this presentation I will talk to you a bit about the theoretical underpinnings of the program and also talk about the experiences we've had in evaluating the programs that have been run across Queensland. Um, various parts of New South Wales and also in New Zealand. And so let me move on to just what do I mean by this thing about ethics. The idea about ethics as an underpinning to the notion of sexual violence prevention comes from the work of the French philosopher Michel Foucault. And he would probably be appalled at the idea that this work was being used in such a way, but be that as it may. Um, his notion was that if we really want to think about being an ethical person or an ethical subject, we need to be mindful of caring for ourselves, but we also need to understand that that has an impact on other people. And in that process, we need to negotiate and we need to find out what it is that the other person is going to experience, just because we want to do certain things with them in the context of uh, a sexual encounter doesn't necessarily mean that the other person does. And I'm sure you can think of many situations where people you know, might be dancing with somebody in a club, they might go home with them. How do we know what is in the head of both of the people? 
one person might be thinking, oh, this might be nice, we might have a few kisses and you never know where it might end up, but the other person might have a whole other scenario worked out that could involve the whole range of, let's say, the menu of what's possible in sexual um, expression. So how do you actually put those two things together? So the notion of ethics has been important because it also works from a position of the idea that we can all be ethical people. Even if we've done things in the past that we regret, and I'm sure many of us could point to those, there is always a possibility. The notion of ethics is a, an ongoing dynamic. It's not a static process. It's not a decision you make once in your life. It's something that constantly involves, and certainly it involves in the context of sexual encounters. So out of all of this, I did some um, interviews with young people and talked to them a lot about the things that they felt were missing in uh, sexual assault prevention education, so that was my focus. And um, what they told me was that, you know, most of their education had been about plumbing and mechanics, very little of it had been about how to negotiate, how to pick up, how do you deal with conflict, all of those sorts of things. And very few people had had in their school education anything about violence prevention, certainly in um, New South Wales where I did the interviews. If they got anything, it was basically just say no. Once again, we retreat to a risk discourse, just say no. So if you've said no and it doesn't work, well then where does that leave you? you know, once again, you're in the problem kind of position. So out of that, the sex and ethics program, um, was developed, which is a six weeks program, and I just want to talk to you a bit about the content. As you can see, there are a number of different areas that we cover. We begin by looking at the different perspectives on sexuality from young people, and this is drawn from interviews, so that they're real life examples that young people can relate to. And one of the things that's very interesting in that first week is that young people seem quite amazed that other young people think really differently about sex to them. It's that kind of friendship group, peer group notion that if we all think this, then everybody else must think it too. So they find it quite um, challenging to find that other people feel differently. So in the role play we use in that example, we would have a variety of different people. We would have a young man who's a committed Christian who doesn't believe in sex till he's married. We might have a young lesbian woman. Um, who's dealing with her own issues about how does she negotiate consent in that context. We might have a, a heterosexual man who is um, very respectful of women and wants to negotiate. We might have somebody else who's um, very into casual sex and really isn't that interested in finding out what the other person wants. There are all of these sorts of elements and so that illuminates the differences for them. We then, in the second week, move on to talk about the sexual ethics framework, which I'll um, come to in a moment. And then we move on to talking about the pressures to be sexual, whether that comes from friends, what happens when you know, you're out drinking or drugging and you know, there's a sexual possibility. The skills in nonverbal communication, desires and wants. The law and sexual consent, and what I've found is that many young people are very interested in the law, but they know very little about it. Uh, you ask a group of people, you say, what's the age of consent? And you'll get all different kinds of answers, and certainly I know you've got different answers in Queensland than we do in, other, in New South Wales about some things. Um, so they actually want to know about it, but it's really not foremost in their mind when they're about to go and pick up someone. They're not thinking, what's the law say about this? <laughs> uh, so we then move on to thinking about skills in negotiating ethical consent, conflicting desires and wants in casual and ongoing relationships, breaking up ethically, which is a very popular week, that session, they love doing that. And what are the, is it ethical to actually, you know, change your status on Facebook as a way of ending a relationship <laughs> um, or texting or even getting your parents to tell them? Um, so they find that a lot of fun. And then by the last week, you can see that these weeks we've been focusing very much on their interpersonal skills. We then start to move the issue into a discussion about how can we take the notion of ethics into being an ethical friend and being an ethical bystander? Now, this is an, a notion about 
we all have some role to play in challenging sexual and other forms of violence. And if you see things and you don't intervene, how much have you condoned with that? So we talk to them about ways in which they can um, safely intervene in potentially risky situations. And some of those will have a sexual element. Others could be around racism and homophobia. So it has a broader application. I'm quite happy to talk to you a bit more about that as we uh, move into the discussion period. So what is this sex and ethics framework? <coughs> It has four elements and the pluses are very important because my argument is that without all of these we're probably not as being as ethical as we'd like. Okay, so care of myself. How do I think about what I need to do to look after myself in this situation or this relationship? Am I thinking about my own needs? Have I been in this situation before? Did it turn out well? Did it turn out badly? Does anyone know where I am? Have I thought about safe sex? All of these kinds of range of issues that someone might run through in their mind. Plus being aware of my desires and wants and the possible impact on the other person. As I said before, just if, because you want to have sex doesn't necessarily mean the other person does. They might want to have sex, but they might not want to have it, want to have it in the way you want to have it, and they may not want to have it right then. It might be later, or it might be some other form that you haven't talked about. So that's where negotiating and asking becomes crucially important. How do we negotiate this transaction? Because effectively it is a transaction. And the ask is in inverted commas because we're trying to acknowledge the non-verbal element that happens in many sexual encounters. As I'm sure you're aware, often people don't talk a lot necessarily, particularly in casual context. Um, it, there may be more communication, certainly, as the relationship develops, or there may be less, depending on the nature of the relationship. And then a process of reflection. Now, this looks quite a static kind of framework, but in fact, the idea of it is that it's very dynamic and that it's constantly being reworked and reshaped. And so what we're trying to do is to give young people, if you like, a bit of a a navigation tool to help them to work out what, what to do in various situations. Um, and you'll see from some of the comments how young people have used that. So this framework underpins all of the activities in the program. So it's the theoretical link that runs through it. It doesn't take a position that says anything that you do is particularly wrong. The only requirement in the and, and sort of um, limit in the program is that no form of violence or coercion is acceptable, but the kind of activities that you engage in, we don't really care about. We want you to think about whether they're ethical for you, uh, and I think only individuals can make that decision. I don't know that you know we should have a blanket ruling. If you look historically, there have been many things that people said were not okay that we now think are perfectly fine. So it is really very much a decision um, about what is okay in the process of a negotiated ethical response with another person. Okay, now I'm going to focus my comments on the evaluation that I've got about New South Wales. I will say a few things about Queensland, but we haven't finished the report on that, so it's not really at a point to be published yet. So in terms of New South Wales, um, in 2009, we received funding um, from the federal government uh, under the Respectful Relationships Program to do another run of programs. With the first lot were uh, reported in the book, um, and these were in Armadale, Greater Western Sydney, the Central Coast, and the AIDS Council of New, Ca of New South Wales ran um, a young lesbian group and a young gay male group. Um, I trained with my colleague from Rape Crisis, um, Karen Willis. Um, 13 educators and the idea of the way the program is structured is that we train people to actually do the program, they then go out and run it with young people. The argument is um, very, a very clear position by me which is that if you're going to ask young people to hold up their lives to ethical scrutiny then we as educators should do that about ourselves as well. So when educators come to the program they actually do the program. 
And that may seem a bit strange. I mean, you know, many of us pick up a program, we just go and run with it. But what I can say to you, having run many of these groups all over the place now with educators, that even the most experienced educators often find this very challenging because it's an opportunity for them to step back and to reflect on their own practices, their own who are they as a person, and how does that affect their practice working with young people. If they have got particular issues around certain things, how do they actually deal with those? How does that interfere or um, help their work um, with young people? So we've had young people in groups of, and you can see the, um, the breakdown in terms of gender. Um, in this uh, particular uh, study, 42% were same-sex attracted because we had the AIDS Council involvement. So that was quite a high proportion. And we also had 30% culturally diverse, and that was right across the board. We couldn't narrow it down to particular um, diverse, you know, particular categories of, of culture, but they were right across all kinds of um, different cultural backgrounds, the average age being 20. Okay, so one of the very important parts of what I was trying to do with the Sex and Ethics program was to build in a rigorous evaluation process. I'm sure many of us have been to educational uh, programs and at the end of them we're asked to fill in a sheet. In fact, you may be asked to do that today to ask you what you thought about the program. Now, these are known as really in the literature as customer satisfaction surveys or we call them happy sheets because generally speaking by the end of a program most people are pretty happy with what happens. The limit about this is that it doesn't tell you anything about behaviour. It doesn't tell you anything about how that knowledge that you might have gained translates into any kind of different sort of practice. So with the Sex and Ethics program, what I did was set up a pre-test. So people in the groups do a short survey at the beginning of the group. They do another one at six weeks. We also collect some sexual history information in week three. And then, most importantly, we follow them up four, five or six months after the groups have ended. Now this is relatively unusual in the sexual violence prevention field and in um, violence prevention education generally. Because the pe people haven't necessarily understood about evaluation. I think as a sector we are underskilled in that area. We still have a long way to go in learning how to do that. There are many ways I think we can build better partnerships, say, between universities and practitioners to work on that process and with government. Um, and so it is pretty uncommon that people do longer term follow-ups. So having said that, um, my contribution to the field is by doing this with this particular program. And in relation to the New South Wales results, you can see that when we followed people up, um, for it was four to five months, and why there was, there was a difference is because it depended on the funding cycle and also when Christmas occurred. That always blows up your evaluation. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 88% reported using the ideas four to five months after the groups had ended, and 85% had used the skills. And that's a pretty high figure. Um, and this was maintained four to five months after the program was completed. So what that suggests to me is the program, not only did they enjoy it while the time they were doing it, but it had some meaning for them in relation to their lives. And they were using it. And because the program is very focused around the combination of knowledge and skills, we were able to ascertain whether they were using both of those things. Now, I'm going to read this. I know this is against the rules. It's got too many things on it. Um, but it was a good one, and I wanted to use it. So let's hear for some young people. Well, for example, the ethical framework provided in the group has been really helpful. I think I'm usually pretty all right at looking after other people's needs and wants and communicating with them about it. But it hadn't occurred to me how important my own safety or needs were in terms of of having a good ethical approach to negotiating and having sex. That sounds ridiculous, but I just honestly hadn't considered it. 
I mean, I'd thought before about what I wanted, but not about taking my safety, emotional and physical, into account in terms of good decision making. That's from a young woman, 23. And this one, I gained a better understanding of body language and how to read it. By that I mean that I gained a better appreciation of how signals can be misinterpreted. This is from a young man. Now why this is particularly important is that the reading of non-verbal communication, we know from other research that men in particular overestimate the signals. So if a woman says, I'd like to have a coffee with you, I'll have a drink then some men interpret that as meaning, right, I'm in there with, like, Flynn, you know. <laughs> I've got all, everything's going to work out. Whereas, you know, the woman is thinking, well, I want to have a drink, you know, I want to get to know you a bit. So this subtlety, and we use a lot of activities to get people to learn the skills of how you read nonverbal communication. So this was very pleasing to hear this, uh, particularly from a young man. And the other thing... Um, Sexual assault doesn't always look like what you might expect it to, how it can be much more subtle and socially complicated than being attacked by a stranger in a dark alley. Now, this notion of sexual assaultology about sexual assault is long-standing. We all are aware of this, I'm sure, that there is this concept of the stranger danger, whereas, in fact, you're most at risk from somebody you know. And if this happens in the context of a relationship, um, and there may be other forms of violence as well, it's not necessarily is it often talked about. So we were also trying to encourage them to understand the complexity of sexual assault and it's the grey, you know, in, in that picture. Okay, so going to the ethical bystander behaviour which I talked to you about before, here is an example uh, from a young gay man from the city a boy came out of a club completely off his trolley and got in a car with four men he didn't know. I and a friend approached the boy and told him he wasn't in the right state of mind to be making these decisions and found his friends for him, then hid from the men in the car. Laughed out, laughed out loud, which was probably a good idea. So they intervened effectively and safely, but they were, aw they were aware of the risk of that situation. So they stepped up into a situation where they thought, this is really dodgy, this guy is really not in a position to be going off with these four guys. And we can talk about the ethics of whether you get involved in the situation or not, if you like, in the questions. Here's a couple of other bystander ones. Uh, and these are quite common um, stories that the young people tell us in their feedback. At a party situation, a very drunk girl was about to be led to a bedroom. I confronted the man and expressed my concerns. I then asked the girl if she would prefer staying at my house and took her there instead. In the morning she thanked me profusely." So you can again see that by that intervention, where she intervened safely, she didn't place herself at risk, she did it in a, you know, a way in which um, had a good result, for, particularly for the young woman, who, you know, there could have been some very poor outcomes, shall we say, out of that experience. And the program helped me determine what my own values are and what I seek from a relationship. I also feel more confident in negotiating and reading what the other person is feeling, while leaving space for them to be direct in saying yes or no. So what you start to see from some of these few, very few examples that we've got of, from lots of young people is the notion that we introduce that runs through the program of the care of the self and the other is also reflected in their comments where they say, I know what my own values are now, but I also know that I can negotiate with another person and I can think about that. So there's a sense in which they are becoming much more conscious about the decision making they're making rather than um, sex just happening um, and people going, well, what was that about? You know, so how did I end up here? That kind of notion. And this comment, I thought it was a great program and I really learned a lot from it. Even till this day, I'm still thinking and reminding myself about some of the ideas that I learned in the group discussion and learned a lot about respecting other people's wishes as well as mine. So this is a, you know, this is a you know, joy to an educator. Uh, to hear this and I mean we've had many other examples as a young woman from a country area um, who she told us that she um, had put the ethical framework up on, a, up on a chart in her bedroom 
And she and her girlfriends would have a look at this every Friday night before they went out. I mean, you know, whatever makes it work, the fact that they were thinking that there was an issue they needed to consider was most important, I think, rather than just finding themselves in situations which were problematic. Okay, so what are some of the implications and some of the things we can learn um, from Sex and Ethics Program at this point? Um, it's an example, I think, of research-based evidence prevention education. It brings together, for me personally, my background as a practitioner but also as a, an academic researcher, to be able to bring together those two things to also try and, and make um, an intervention, I guess, in, in a social transformative way to, and from a positive angle of saying we can do something about preventing sexual violence particularly in coerced situations, pressured situations in dating contexts. Um, it brings together research and practice from sexuality and violence prevention education, uh, which traditionally they've often been parallel disciplines and practices. So you might one day have somebody coming into a school, for example, doing it from family planning, and then the next day you might have somebody coming in from you know, a domestic violence service. So, you know, what's that about? What, what are we actually doing there? I think there are much greater links for us to make about how we think about whole people. Young people don't see themselves as demarcated by funding rules and policy constraints. They are just living their lives and they have needs and issues across the spectrum and across the range of experiences from positive to um, absolutely horrible. It works from a strength-based model as well in that it's saying that young people are and can be ethical people in their relationships. And this is a reaction I guess I've had as a criminologist against the sort of moral panic and problematising that occurs particularly around a lot of young people that sees them all as a problem and they're you know, going to lead to the downfall of the fabric of society. I mean, people have been saying that you know, since a year dot. I mean, many of you are too young to re and remember the beatniks and, and uh, that sort of period. All of those people who've come through different periods of history of young people have actually had that laid at their door. And, you know, there's some young people who are really scary and we need to manage them very carefully, but there's a heck of a lot of young people, that I find, who are extremely thoughtful and want the knowledge, have a thirst for it. Um, the program focuses on building ethical practices rather than focus on stopping unethical behaviour. So it, it's working towards a development to try and bring about cultural change where people say, it's not okay that you just said that about that woman. You know, and group of people, friends standing up to others and people intervening. Um, it focuses on skills, not only just knowledge, and this is crucially important, I think, if we want to make a contribution to primary prevention uh, and really try and stop this before it occurs. And it provides a decision-making model that the young people, I think, find fun and easy to get their head around, which balances the fact that um, sexual relationships in particular can be pleasurable, but there also is a spectrum and they can also be dangerous. So it balances that out, it doesn't shy away, it's not a Pollyanna type program saying it's all fabulous, it's saying these are some of the challenges, but um, you know, in that process where people focus purely on risk, they tend to run a discourse which says you know, that sex is bad and it's not okay. Um, I don't accept that position, that's my um, ethical stance on that. I think I'd like to stop there and, and open up for questions and I'm sure this, you might want to ask about the other programs in New Zealand and also in Queensland as well if you wish. Um, it averages out at about 20 and in, in, to date I've recruited people who've been 16 to 25. That was partly to do with some of the challenges <coughs> I had with the University Ethics Committee when I started this work. They've now recently given me approval to go to 14 with parental approval. Uh, but it has been a process, I can tell you, because as you imagine, you want to talk to young people about sex. <coughs> Ethics committees get a bit nervous. I, I, I'm waiting for what they're going to say about primary age children. That'll be a challenge in itself. Well, from when they start 
primary, we wouldn't be going into early childhood education. Um, I mean, the reason why this is important is that what we've found, obviously, with working with this older population is without, you know, um, exception, they all say we wanted this earlier. And I mean, the argument is that if you want to build <coughs> respectful relationships, you have to start that very early. Now, clearly, we're not necessarily going to be talking to, you know, primary age kids about sex, sex as such, but. Young children do have ideas about sexuality, as my co-researcher Kerry Robinson has found. I mean, she did research with young people in um, young children in um, childhood education, you know, pre what we used to call preschool, and they had lots of ideas um, about who had relationships with who and what they did and all kinds of things. And they were only four and five. So, you know, I think sometimes we don't we don't give them credit. And they had some very funny ideas as well. <laughs>
Um, there's a possibility that there will be one in um, rural New South Wales next year and I'm working with that local community, the Aboriginal community, to talk about how we refine the program to meet the particular needs of that population. And I think this raises a really important point that comes through prevention education research that, you know, this, I think this program is pretty good and it's getting pretty good results, but no one program can meet the needs of everybody. And in order for it to be tailored to the particular needs of population groups, you've got to do things with it. And certainly you've got to refine it in a way that is sensitive to the particular needs of whatever the group is, whether it's homeless young people, or whether it's cultural difference, or even when we were running the group with um, same-sex attracted young people, we needed to do some adaption. Even, you know, we got, got case studies and various things in there and characters that reflected that. But they wanted more than that. They wanted particular kinds of um, situations that were more common to those young people who were living pretty much in the city um, and the kinds of things that would come up. So those adaptions have been made as we've gone along since this was actually produced. Um, and it keeps on being a dynamic process. Yeah, interesting question. Um, not directly. We haven't... We haven't <coughs> surveyed them or talked to them. We've had heard through our, some of our educators uh, that parents have been pretty happy about it, but we haven't got any hard data, which is another reason why in this new grant we also want to engage parents a bit mm. more. Um, yeah, certainly. It's tricky, isn't it? Because I think it's a hard job for parents. And mm. what I found when I did the interview research with the young people was that some had parents who had a very open kind of relationship and always had talked about a variety of things. And so when this issue, you know, these issues came up, they were all talking about them as well. For others, they didn't want to know anything about it. They said, well, the schools are dealing with that. And then there were some others who had very hard, what I would call hard line positions, which was no sex before marriage and... Um, homophobic attitudes, which was really problematic for the same sex attracted young people, um, or then simply things which said, well, just keep yourself nice, <laughs> but no conversation. And what, and what, what it, I did find, when, and this was only from the young people's perspective, was that I asked them who talked to them about these things. Most of it was school, but then I'd say to them, who else? And um, if a parent, parental figure talked to them, it was their mother's. The fathers were usually completely absent, whether it was young men or whether it was women. So there's a challenge there for some fathers, I think, not all of them, but some of them to step up and to actually have some conversations with their young men about how you, you know, approach these issues. And some, there were a few who were able to say, my father was very clear that I need to respect women and I need to treat them in a certain way and it's not okay to take advantage of situations and they had a very clear father who took a line on that, but the majority of the men didn't. And so what was the default? Their friends. And, you know, your 14-year-old friend is not necessarily the best informed advisor. The intention may be good, but they may not necessarily have all of the information open to their disposal. Or the other opportunity is pornography, which, of course, we know brings with it a whole set of other things, including unrealistic expectations, <coughs> let alone, you know, misogynist practices and so forth. So I think we as a, you know, many communities find it very hard to have these conversations. And I think it's very hard for parents often. I know in terms of the new work that we're doing that our other colleague who's on the grant, Sue Dyson from La Trobe University, has done a lot of interviews with parents in Western Australia about issues about sexuality and how you talk to your children about it. And they, I mean, the summary of it was they were floundering. They didn't know how to do it. They wanted to do it and they wanted to do it better than their own experience of their parents. But in the absence of knowing what to do, they reverted to what their parents did and then felt so bad that they had retreated to cutting the conversation, being embarrassed, and so forth. But also, the reason why we didn't talk to parents 
in this initial period was so many of the young people made it clear they don't want to talk to their parents about any of this. But, you know, there's that point where it's, you know, whatever. I don't want to know, you know. For those who didn't have an open, ongoing dialogue with their parents, and certainly there were some of those, but for the others it was, this was a demarcation between that's my life and I'm mum, don't ask me. And if dad even raised it, cool. Well, it's obviously preferable if they've got a context for it. Um, without the context, they probably wouldn't understand what it meant. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that could be tricky. Um, I mean, I think you, leaving literature around is a, is a good strategy because mm -hmm. they either pick it up or they won't. Mm -hmm. But as most you know, young people also <coughs> access a lot of stuff on the net, uh, that's their default position, then mm -hmm. I think we have to think about ways in which we can direct them to information sites that might give them some useful information rather than mm. not useful. Mm. Um, there's two parts what you're asking. Did we screen people before they went into groups? We did. We screened them on the basis of um, the educators talk to them, found out if they had any recent experiences of sexual violence or other forms of intimate violence. Um, our argument was that if they were still in the process of beginning their recovery, we thought it probably wasn't at the right point. And there were young women in particular who wanted to do this um, program, but their counsellors felt it was actually too soon. So that was one criteria. We also, if there was... Um, any history of offending behaviour that we knew about, and of course you don't necessarily know, and they're less likely to self-select to do the program. The other thing is that what an unforeseen positive consequence of the program has been that many of the educators that, that I've trained are actually counsellors, either in some sort of sexual violence or child abuse service or child sexual assault service. Um, or domestic violence areas as well. And what they have done is used elements of the program in their direct work with individuals. Yeah. So the notion of the ethical framework they've introduced into, into their conversations and their work with people to help them think about, well, are you actually caring for yourself? <laughs> so while I've made a particular focus on sexual assault, the, I think the implications and the applications are much broader because the notion of ethical practices is clearly one that runs across all gamuts of human behaviour. So I think it is, and it's certainly being used. That's happening in New Zealand as well as um, in, in New South Wales that I'm aware of. Well, there's, two, there's two things. One is the program is out in the public domain. Anybody can pick it up and decide to run it, and people do do that. The issue is whether people want to be an accredited sex and ethics um, educator. If they do that, then they need to do a five-day training program, um, which still to date involves me <laughs> and um, whoever else I can get to do it with me. And it's a matter of I go on request. Um, I try to run two training programs a year um, for people, and I did one earlier in the year that brought people from all around Australia, but they have to pay to do it. Um, and if, you know, Western Australia wants me to do more next year, I'll go there and do some more work there. And therefore, you're building the capacity of people in the community who can then take it and run with it. Because I, I don't want to hold on to it. I want to, you know, um, what's the word? Disseminate it um, through the community. So that, you know, it's all possible. It just depends on time and money, like many things. Um, we haven't run it actually on a site of a school at this point. What we've done is recruited through schools and run it outside of it. Um, in terms of the school issue, I think there's a couple of things. I think there's an adaption you can make. Usually the sessions run two to three hours, which is too long, obviously, in the context of the average school schedule. They can be broken at certain points because the activities are discrete but linked. Uh, the other thing, the big thing that I have about running it directly in schools is 
it would need to be voluntary and it would need to be done in such a way, obviously, that those people really wanted to do it. Um, because of the nature of the material, it could become ammunition in the playground. So we need to, be, we need to make sure the, safe, the place is safe for that kind of intervention. Um, and I think that is possible, and there are a number of people who are looking at being able to do that. Um, so I think it, it is, certainly, and I would like to see it. But I, I wouldn't want it to ever be seen as everybody in Year 10 is now doing this program, because that would work against the spirit of it. Um, other people have asked me to do it in juvenile detention. I said, well, I can't. There's, you know, you can't force people to do a program. That's about ethics. It's completely contradictory. <laughs> uh, we found about 12 around that number. Yeah. Any bigger than that and it starts to get a bit unwieldy. But you need that many, maybe 12. Maybe you could go to 14, allowing for dropout or people being away. I just want to thank you, not only for that wonderful presentation, but just for the work that you're doing. It's Fantastic and making such a wonderful contribution to our communities across the whole country and internationally, including New Zealand and other places. So I'm just really grateful for your work and, and uh, you. for the opportunity to have you come to Mackay to share some of it with us today.